right. Well, let's open our Bibles now to Matthew uh, chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And we do want to welcome all of our listeners. This is our devotional time on Tuesday at Southwest Radio Ministries. And uh, I want to speak on the topic, Choices, the Wise and the Foolish. Choices, the Wise and the Foolish. You know, the method of uh, ancient teachers was to tell stories where there was a wise man and an unwise man. And that's exactly what Jesus does in Matthew chapter 7, 13 through 29. He speaks about the wise and the foolish. And because we have a, um, a description of wisdom and foolishness, we want to make application to our own lives. So this is, this is the way Jesus taught. This is the way the ancients taught, not only in Israel, but in Greece and Rome and China. Uh, presenting the wise person and the outcome of that person's life and the foolish person and the outcome of that person's life. And so to put it uh, in modern language, we could speak about the wise driver and the unwise driver, okay, just to make it really relevant. Or we could call him or her the wise car owner and the unwise car owner. So the wise car owner, what does he or she do? Well, uh, follows uh, what's recommended regarding the change of oil and the various fluids and lubrication and uh, tire rotation. Okay, that's the wise car owner, the wise driver. The outcome of that person's life or car ownership is that that person gets a lot of trouble-free mileage out of their vehicle. Okay, that's the wise person. Then you contrast that with the unwise person. The unwise person never changes the oil, never uh, takes it to be lubricated, never rotates the tires. What's the outcome of that person's life or that person's um, time with his or her automobile? Expensive repairs breakdowns on the interstate. So there's the wise and the foolish. Now here, uh, Jesus is speaking about two ways, the way of the wise person and the way of the foolish person. Let's look at uh, Matthew 7, and uh, I want to read verses 13 and 14. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Verse 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate or the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So here we have two gates, two ways. There's the broad way, okay, the wide open gate. It's very, very attractive. Anybody can go in. You can believe anything. You can um, live any kind of a lifestyle. Uh, it's very, very attractive. And the reason why it's very attractive, because you're never wrong. Now put that in quotes, okay? But how would that work in life? I is it possible to be never wrong? Supposing you gave change. You were a, a cashier at Walmart or some, some store. And uh, do you think the customer would want the right change? Yeah, the customers get pretty narrow, don't, don't they? Or um, supposing um, you want to uh, get into your computer, uh, can you just use any old password? What's your password? We we'll, we'll just use any old password. Will it work? That's the broad way. No, it won't work. Supposing you go to your um, money machine and uh, you want to take money out, uh, do you have to really be fussy about your PIN number? Oh, just any, any old PIN number will work, won't it? Well, just put 1111 or 1234 or 5430. Will that work? That's the broad way. It will not work. Or supposing uh, you want to fly to California or someplace and... Um, uh, your ticket says United Airlines, 
but you want to do the broad way. How, how about get on American Airlines? You think American Airlines and, and your flight is 5432 on uh, United, but you get on 1320 American. Do you think you'll go the same, the right place where you want to go? Of course not. But that's the broad way. That's what people want today. Anything will work. Any kind of a lifestyle. Two guys getting married, two women getting married, whatever. Uh, living in fornication, living in sin, that's the broad way. Jesus says that's the way of death and it's the way of destruction. Or to use another illustration, how about if you um, go to the Atlanta airport? Now remember the broad way, okay, the broad way, the wide open way. And uh, it says you have to go to um, D34, Concourse D34. And a little train comes. How many of you have been, been to the concourse in Atlanta? Most people, Houston is the same. Little train comes by and you get on and says, uh, uh, next stop is uh, concourse A. You say, well, I think I'll get off at concourse. No, wait a second. You're supposed to go to D34. Does the Broadway work? It does not. It's the way of foolishness. So right away, Jesus is saying, yeah, the, the Broadway, hey, it's so attractive. You can never be wrong, in quotes. Where people really stumble is in the issue of salvation. I don't have to believe anything. I can believe in Harry Krishna. I can believe in Buddha. I can believe my own religion. I can worship the stars. I can worship the trees. What did Jesus say? Didn't he say the way is very narrow? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So once again, we see the two ways. The narrow way is very hard. Uh, many go into the broad way. Uh, it's so attractive. Just go in and you can do whatever you want. You don't need to give the right change. You don't need to have the right password. You don't need to have the right PIN number. You don't need to get on the right airline any way you want. Well, of course, we know that's dumb. It doesn't work. The same is true with salvation. There's one way. It's a narrow way. It's the way of truth through Jesus Christ. So here in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, we see this powerfully illustrated when Jesus is speaking about enter ye in at the straight gate, that narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way to what? Eternal life, destruction, destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. That's what we have in the world today. There are many going through that wide gate. They say, oh, that looks, you know, I don't have to believe the Bible. I don't have to confess my sins. I don't have to believe in uh, a Jewish Messiah. That's, uh, that's kind of corny died on the cross? Who ever heard of such stuff? A bloody cross. Well, that's terrible. That's pagan. I don't want to believe that. Well, okay. Jesus tells us what happens. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Now there's a, a second contrast, and that's in Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Let's notice Matthew 7, 15 through 20. He's speaking about two trees. We first looked at two ways, now he's speaking about two trees. He says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Now notice that. Okay, they look good on the outside. Okay, they really, they're really slick. Uh, they dress well. They say nice things. They've got a nice magazine. Um, they've got some kind of a program at their church where you can buy survival food, where you can be loved by that group of people and so forth. It looks really good. But Jesus said, ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Okay, if you go to a thorn bush and it's really nasty, it's got these big thorns, do you get some really big juicy grapes? No, not at all. So he says, verse 17, even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. 
Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And then he says in verse 20, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. So Jesus is telling us um, something that I think is extremely important for us to remember. We need to remember that there are many false prophets. And many false prophets, actually all the false prophets, sometimes they're very good at rhetoric. They use flowery words. They, if you follow my religion, uh, if you send me $100 or whatever it is, you're guaranteed a spot in heaven. You don't have to repent of your sin. You don't have to read of the Bible. You don't have to uh, do this, that, and everything else. They look really slick. They got the nicest smile. Maybe they've had some uh, teeth implants and uh, really a nice hair comb and so forth. But what does he say? You take off that facade and inside they are ravening wolves. And so um, we learn that it's very difficult to counterfeit good character. Okay, we could be a counterfeit on the outside, but you can't counterfeit good character. You will know a tree by its fruit. You will know a person, a teacher, a religious leader by their fruit. We can apply this to um, elections, and uh, we've got an election coming up, a presidential election. Um, people run for political office. Why? Because they want to win. So what do they do? They play the crowd. They know exactly what to say. If you vote for me, you won't have to work. Uh, you'll have free housing. You'll have free health care. The world will be nice. You'll be loved by the government. Just do it my way. Vote for me. And people say, boy, that really sounds good. But look at their character. What kind of a lifestyle do they lead? What is the end of their beliefs? They're secularists, they're atheists, they're Satanists. What is the outcome of their lives? Do they, do they support the family? Do they support clean living? Do they support honesty and virtue? Do they always tell the truth or do they lie just to get your votes? If they lie to get your votes, then once they've got your vote, then guess what? They get in office, can you trust them? Absolutely not. So here Jesus talks about two trees. And then he speaks about two professions. Let's read from Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Matthew 7 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So notice, there are a lot of people who talk right, and they say the right things. They even come to him and say, Lord, Lord. Okay, you remember the rich young ruler. He said to Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In Mark chapter 10, he had the word, right words. He, he called Jesus a good teacher. And here we have those who Jesus says will say the right thing. And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Can you imagine what that day will be like? Multitudes of people who thought they were washed in the blood. Multitudes of people who thought because they went to church, because their name was on a church roll, because they carried a King James Bible around, because they had a great big King James Bible, and they had all these notes on the margins. They thought, hey, I'm okay. I'm really wonderful. I'm clean. I don't smoke or chew or run around with women who do. Therefore, I'm going to heaven. Jesus says many will say that. And there are lots of people, conservative people. I wonder if they're trusting in Jesus, are they washed in the blood? Or is there faith? Is there a religion, something that they used to clobber people with, and I'm better than you. You don't believe in the fundamentals of the faith. I'm this and I'm that. Jesus said, they're going to say, Lord, Lord. And notice what he says. Many will say to me on that day. And that he says, depart from me, you who practice evil. 
Now, it doesn't mean we have to be perfect. Not a one of us is perfect. But he says those who practice evil as a continuous way of life, those who are tilted toward evil, they never gather with the people of God of the Lord's day. They never read their Bibles. They never pray. They never honor Jesus Christ. You can't tell that they're any different from the rest of the world. Jesus says there are many people like that. The day will come when he says, depart from me, you who work iniquity. I never knew you. So we've got two ways, two trees, two professions, and then I want you to notice two builders. Let's look at Matthew 7, 24 and 20, uh, through 27. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So the wise builder is the person who anticipates storms. Uh, Louisiana has floods, you know, the great flood um, that they had recently. Hurricanes in Florida. Uh, we used to live in the Florida Keys. Uh, we used to live in Hurricane Alley. Now we live in Tornado Alley. So you've got to be ready, okay? The winds blow. Um, and I'm thinking of, uh, there was a picture I remember seeing of um, a news reporter from maybe CBS or whatever. Uh, he was speaking to a man in Florida right after Hurricane Andrew. And the whole place, it looked like Hiroshima. The houses were down. Everything was down, just piles of rubble and piles of wood. But one house, one house was standing. And the reporter said, sir, how, how come your house is standing? He said, I built it according to code. I followed directions. My house is standing. We have to build our lives according to code. So here we see that life can be hard without Jesus, no doubt about it. So the wise builder um, is someone who puts effort into not only the construction, but also where he builds his house on the rock. We need to build our lives on Jesus Christ. Now, Notice verse 26 of Matthew 7. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not. So the problem is not ignorance. Okay, it's not that this foolish man is ignorant, didn't hear. That's not the problem. We're not judged for what we don't know. We're judged for what we do know but don't do. That's very important. In fact, I want to close with 2 Peter chapter 3. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we read these words, beginning in verse 1. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before of the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lust. Now notice what they say. Where is the promise of his coming? They knew about Jesus' coming. They weren't ignorant about the return of the Lord. And they say, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now notice verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So the question is not their ignorance. They knew the word. These foolish builders knew the sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happened to them? Their house was destroyed. You know, friends, I'm maybe talking to someone out there who's never put their faith in Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to the Savior. Uh, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye who labor 
and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You will not find rest in the world. You will not find rest in immorality or in booze or in drugs or in foolishness of any sort. You will find rest in Jesus Christ. Have you put your faith in Him? He's willing and able to, to save you to the uttermost, from the guttermost to the uttermost, by believing. The Word of God says this, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Friend, if you've never reached out your spiritual hand and said, Lord, take my hand. I, I, I'm a sinner. I, I confess my sins. I, I need your help. I know you're merciful. You love me. You died for my sins. If you say that and pray that, that prayer asking Jesus to come into your heart and save you and give you new life, he will do it. And that's not my word. That's the word of God. And so I invite you, even this day, to come to Jesus. If you have any other questions, give me a call at 1-800-652-1144. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this teaching from your word about the wise and the foolish. We thank you for the privilege of sharing the everlasting gospel of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lead us, guide us this day. And Father, for those out there who have never uh, put their faith in your Son, I pray that you would give them no rest, that you would give them nightmares, that you would cause them to be troubled, that you would allow their consciences to provoke them and prod them and step on their toes and awaken them, for they are at the very precipice of eternal damnation. But may they come to see that you love them. May they receive Jesus into their hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.